Hello and welcome to Redeem 2020 Ministries Friday Night Bible Study. I'm Jason Drake. We're glad to have you here. Each week we get together to open up God's Word and investigate what does it say, what does it mean, and how does it apply to us. Tonight we'll be starting a new series, a number of weeks where we will study Jesus and his claim to divinity, being God, and how he did this through the statements he made, I am. Grab your Bible. Get a notebook and a pen so you can take notes. Let's get into it. Now is the time for us to take a look back again at the person of Jesus. If you want to look back through the Bible studies we've done in the past, we've done a number of them on Jesus, on what Jesus taught and who Jesus is. And tonight we're going to do that again. We're going to start a series called Jesus the Great I Am. Great I Am. Now that's a very important phrase in the Bible. The great I am. And the phrase, it was used by Jesus when Jesus began making some statements that are recorded in the scriptures. Jesus said, I am, and he gave nine different times or nine different phrases where he said, I am. Now, we want to look at these because it's very important for us to understand what the Bible has to say about Jesus. Did Jesus really claim to be God? You know, there's, there's argument about that today. And people who want to have an agenda or take one side or the other. But we want to look and see for ourselves what did Jesus say about his claim to be God? Did Jesus claim to be God? And so in these nine statements that we're going to be looking at, we're going to be trying to understand how these statements that Jesus made will apply to that particular question. Did Jesus claim to be God? And that's going to be important. You know, it's important to our faith. I want to know the truth. I am a person who seeks the truth. And as a result, when I study the Bible, I want to look at it and try to understand and study as deeply as I can because there are a lot of people out there who will throw around statements about the Bible who really haven't read it. They haven't studied it. They've heard people talk about the Bible. They've heard people make statements about God or Jesus, and they repeat those statements without having really looked at what the Bible says. So that's why it's important. And I'll encourage you tonight, we're going to be moving around a number of places, but if you've got a Bible, pull out your Bible and something to take notes with and something to take notes on because you're going to want to write some things down. And I, I would encourage you to investigate on your own. Why would I do that? I don't want you to just take my word for it. And I don't want you to just see these scripture verses up on the screen, which I'll do. But I want you to go back and look at them yourself and read and try and understand and see what does the Bible say to you? And even ask as you read, ask God to open your heart, open your mind, open your thoughts so that you, you can understand and be assured because that's what the Bible is all about, that we be assured of our faith. We don't have a blind faith. We don't have as a Christian, we don't follow a blind faith. You know, Eric Clapton used to be in a band called Blind Faith, and they sang songs about in the presence of the Lord. But we're not, we, we don't practice a blind faith. Our faith has reason. Our faith has evidence. Our faith will also go one step beyond our reason, because that's what faith is. Faith is an assurance in things that we don't see. If you've seen them, if you've proved them, then it doesn't take faith. In fact, it doesn't take faith to believe that this world was not made by itself. This world was not made just because a bunch of rocks sat around for a couple of billion years doing nothing but thinking. Rocks don't think. We know that. Rocks don't plan. They don't decide. They don't decide what they're going to become. They don't work on trying to develop legs. That's not what happens. That's never been shown. There's never been any evidence and no proof. But what we do know is that just like I'm an artist, and as an artist, I produce paintings. If you look, this is just one of my sketches. 
If you look at one of my paintings, you can see that the, the paint didn't just fall on the paper by itself out of the sky. I didn't just lay the paper down and see droplets of color start appearing out of nowhere. If I left it here for a billion years, I don't think any of this would have still ever happened. But a painting proves by all sense of reason that there was a painter. <laughs> it also tells you something about the painter. It tells you something about the way the painter thinks and the way the painter describes and some things about why the painter chose this subject matter. That's proof. That's an ir irrefutable sense of logic. So it doesn't take faith to believe that there's a God, a powerful God, who made all things. We can look and see in nature and see just like there's a building. And I see the building, I know there was a builder. For me to think that that building came into existence by itself over millions of years would be beyond the realm of reason. It would be lunacy. But the building was there because there was a builder and the building tells me something about the builder, what he's like, what he designed, why, what purposes he had for the building, and if the building met those purposes and so forth. That's why you and I can know. We can be sure with any sense of our reason that there's a God who created all that we see around us and who maintains it, who sustains it. We know that the earth is only a micro amount of difference between life on this planet and no life on this planet based on how far we are from the sun. And that is something God made and God maintains. We want to know more about him because that influences our faith. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Let's get into this study. I'm going to share my screen with you. So let me open that up. And now you can see my screen and we're going to be talking about this. Whoops. How can I do that? We're not going to do the Ten Commandments. Let me get that off the screen. Boom. Gone. All right. Jesus the Great I Am, part one. Wow, that was a mistake. I didn't even notice. I've been doing the Ten Commandments so many weeks. Okay. Jesus the Great I Am, part one. Now, we're going to discuss nine places or times where Jesus said, I am. Now, let me be sure or to... to to point out, Jesus used the phrase I am in a metaphorical way. He, he presented these metaphors. What's a metaphor? Well, when something is the same as, it'd be like, you know what? If I use the, if, if I say, you did something so well, you hit a home run. Well, you know that's a metaphor. You didn't actually go out on a baseball field and toss a ball and hit it over the fence. It's a metaphor that tells you that you did something great. There's an achievement like a home run. So that's a metaphor. But we're going to get into these statements. Here's the first one. Jesus said, nine times he used this phrase, I am the bread of life. Okay. Next one, I am the light of the world. Jesus, another place he said, I am the door. All right. Another place he said, I am the good shepherd. Number five, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Number six, he said, I am the way. And he said, the truth. I am the truth. And then he said, and I am the life. And finally, we're going to look at, I am the vine. In each of these we'll look at over the next few weeks. Jesus had a purpose for describing himself with these phrases, I am. We want to understand that purpose and see how it applies to Jesus and what he did as he walked through the earth on his ministry. And we also want to see how this applies to our relationship with God, how these understandings can impact the way we learn to know God and trust God. Now, I have a simple outline. We're going to start off because all of these statements, by the way, appear in the book of John. We're going to discuss the book of John and why it's important for us to understand why the writer of John decided to record all these statements that Jesus made. He must have been... Well, we know he was one of Jesus' disciples, and he must have noticed 
wow, Jesus keeps using these statements and I'm going to write them all down because they seem like that they're important. So, and he had a purpose for, the writer had a purpose for wanting to write these kind of things down. Then we're going to look at why the phrase I am is significant. And then we're going to look at what do each of the statements, we're going to examine each one of them. We're going to look at what they mean. And then finally, we're going to discuss how does how do these statements about Jesus impact our faith? All right. Okay, here's here we go. So let's start with the beginning of uh, my outline here. I want to give you some background on the book of John. Someone read for me, if you would, please, this verse from John 20, verse 30, chapter 20, verse 30. Anybody who wants to turn on your mic and read for me, please. <laughs> Anybody you'd like to read for me, please? I'll read it. Go ahead. Um, Go ahead. I'll say it. John twenty thirty. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Okay, so here is the writer of the book of John, and the writer is telling you why he wrote these things. He had a very intentional purpose, and this is what he says. Right here in the middle, you can see, he says, so that you may believe, that's our faith, you may believe what? That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and then he even offers a benefit to that belief that by believing you may have life in his name. Now, let me stop for a moment and give you some background that will help you understand I mean, who is John, right? Let's, let me go back and discuss that with you because uh, John is a little bit different and there is um, some questions, maybe even some discussion among scholars about who wrote this book of John. But let me give you a, a little bigger picture. There are four books at the beginning of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they are named, they were named by uh, Christian leaders uh, after Jesus uh, because they were all written after Jesus was gone, uh, ascended into heaven. And we believe that they were all written within the first 70 years after Jesus' death and that the early church writers would continually refer to these books. And eventually the church writers and church leaders began to see that these books were the authentic uh, stories by the people who were with Jesus. And therefore they were the stories that we now call the gospels, the books. John, the evidence seems to clearly point that John was the disciple, written by the disciple, John, who followed Jesus. He was originally one of the earliest of the people, the men, chosen to follow Jesus as the 12 disciples. So he, he and his brother James were fishermen. They worked for their father. And they were working in the same area as Simon Peter and his brother Andrew. So the four guys, Simon Peter, Andrew, James, and John, Jesus called them to be followers first, and they were the first four. Now, John was unusual in that it's later described that as Jesus developed his ministry, three of his disciples got closer to him and accompanied him on more things with the four of them by themselves, Jesus, Peter, James, and John. So Peter, James, and John were the three that were described as the closest. And they are the three that saw, for instance, Jesus on the top of the mountain. They saw him transfigured into a, a heavenly looking being. And they saw these two, uh, Elijah and Moses were with them and walked him and walking around. So they were the disciples that saw that. It's also true that Peter and John, those two guys together, were the first of the disciples to arrive at the tomb, the morning of Jesus' resurrection. So we 
know that John was with Jesus throughout all of his ministry. So he was an eyewitness to these things and wrote them down. Now, it's very likely because there are some arguments that say John was just a fisherman, not educated, not a theological person, but here he's writing all these heavy theological statements throughout the book of John. I would encourage you, if you have not done it tonight, open up your Bible and start with John 1. You'll see in there that John makes some very assertive statements. You know what? I'm, I'm hearing some background noise. So I'm going to see if I can ask if I can mute those of you who still have your microphones on so I can get rid of that background noise. So, um, so in the, the story of John, John uh, may not have been this guy who had a great, uh, you know, uh, a theological degree, but we know that John would have very logically, not only did he and the disciples get together to study and talk, and we see this in the book of Acts, that the disciples met regularly and and study together and they 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 experience things together but it's also very probable that james or that john would have had somebody who actually as a scribe who dick took his dictation took his story and and write, wrote it out so john again was this guy who saw the miracles saw it was with jesus from the beginning and, and by the way john is also the guy who wrote the book of revelation the book of revelation the last book in the new testament is a prophetic book about the end times. So now these statements, these I am statements of Jesus all appear in John's book. And John was very much a Jew. Don't forget that. Uh, these writers came from Jewish tradition, Jewish heritage. And at the time that Jesus was walking and living and, and ministering here, the, the, the men he chose were men who knew their heritage very well. And they knew that what Jesus was doing was coming to fulfill the role that had been prophesied throughout all of their history as a Messiah coming to save them. Now, what did they think he was going to save them from? Well, we won't get into that tonight, but that's an interesting discussion because there are times when Jesus felt like, hmm, these people don't quite understand why I've come here. So let's go back now. Now that I've given you a little bit of background on who John is, so that you can understand why these statements about John. By the way, um, uh, we just read this verse about where John says, I, I'm writing these things so that you may believe. Let me show you the next verse. He wrote in a letter he was writing to some churches in 1 John 5.13. He says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you may know that you have eternal life. John wanted those who were followers of Jesus to have an assurance to know that they have eternal life. You can know that. And you can know that in your own heart. It's a result of your faith. But that is in fact what God wants you to have, an assurance that you will have eternal life with him. So that's what John wrote about. Now let's go back, let, let, let's look at the second part of my outline. Why is the phrase, I am, significant? Why would that be important? Let's go back and try and understand the beginning. The first time that this verse, or I'm sorry, this phrase was used in the Bible is very important. Now, if you uh, go back to our study on the Ten Commandments, you'll remember, if you just remember your history, or if you watch the movie, The Ten Commandments, uh, you will understand how Moses encountered God in the desert before he went back to Egypt as he, a grown man. In fact, the Bible says he was about 80 years old and he was a shepherd out in the deserts and he encountered God at a place on a mountain where he saw a bush that was on fire but not being consumed. He went up to that, that spot and he heard God speaking to him. And so we have this record, Moses wrote these things down as to his encounter. And here we have in Exodus 3, God is now speaking and Moses in, back and forth. So someone please uh, read this screen for me on Exodus 3. And you'll have a couple of different screens to read. So hang with me, but somebody else, please put on your mic. 
And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people and the children of Israel out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Keep going. He said, But I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? All right, keep going. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent, sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Okay. Very interesting. Now in these verses that we've just read, and Moses is trying to ask God who should I say that you are? By the way, why would he have to bring that up? The people of Israel had descended from Abraham, who was worshiping the one true God. But all the peoples of the nations of that day had their own gods, worshiped their own deities, false gods, gods who were made of idols, made, made with hands, made carved with hands. And so the God of all creation was now telling Moses, I want you to go back representing me. And these people are going to be probably confused. So I want you to make sure that they understand who it is that sent you. And so then God says here, look at the verse on the screen now. I am who I am. Now those words, I am, are merely in Hebrew the same as what you and I would use to say the same words, I am. I am meant in this way, he meant, I am, I have always existed. I do not have a beginning and I do not have an end. Now look further. Say to this people, I am has sent you to me, but then he goes on. Say to the people of Israel, the Lord, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, those are the descendants before them, has sent me to you. Now, here is where we, in, we encounter an interesting part of history. Where the Jewish people look at this word, or these words right here, the Lord. I'm highlighting them there. And it's an interesting point to make because the people of Hebrew faith believe that this is the word that was used. Actually, the words I am is really not what it, it, it is. It's really the Lord. Excuse me, I'm going to change that. The Lord, they decided that this name, the Lord, that's the translation of the Hebrew words, was to be a sacred name that they were to consider holy that they were to not even utter the name of God as it was so holy. They, they identified it only with these letters. Now I'm showing you English letters, Y-H-W-H. -H. And throughout history, the Greeks began to in, translate the Old Testament. They translated the books of Moses. And so they began, the Greeks did, the, the Greeks decided, well, how are we going to put these Greek letters, I mean, these Hebrew letters into some kind of discernible language? And they came up with the letters YHWH, which we pronounce Yahweh. They actually put additional vowels in there so they could have something pronounceable, Yahweh. But in the original Hebrew, there are no vowels in there. Kind of unusual, all right? The Greeks went on to come up with the name Jehovah, and that meant the existing one. And so the Hebrew people 
began to also use names like Adonai. You've probably heard that maybe even in a Christian song, Adonai. And the word Adonai is translated the Lord and is supposed to be uh, an English language representation for these letters, Y-H-W-H. It is said that the, the significance was so important to these people that they would not even utter the name. They were not to do that. And they had only once a year when the priest would go into the temple, would he actually say the names, the name of God, and its meaning because he was addressing God himself in the Holy of Holies. But what's more important too is that this name Tell them the name, the Lord, Yahweh, which I'll just go ahead and pronounce, or Jehovah, was not just to confirm his existence, but most importantly, his presence. So when God was talking to Moses about, I will go with you, he was assuring Moses, I'm going to be present with you. And so God is assuring him, and God also wanted him to assure the people that by even this powerful name, that God would be with them. So it's not just the point that he's eternally existent, although that is implied, but that he is also eternally present with his people. Now, let's go on uh, back to uh, what, why this connects to our study. Here is an interesting verse. I need someone to read this to me. It's in John 8, these, these verses, John 8, 56 to 59. Let's see what Jesus thought about these, this phrase. Someone read that for me, please. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up the stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Okay. Now here's Jesus using the same phrase that God used in talking to Moses on the mountain. And the people who were listening to Jesus at the time knew exactly what he was trying to say about himself. He is saying, before Abraham was, before Abraham existed, I exist. He's using present tense. Before Abraham existed, I exist. They knew what he was trying to imply there was that he existed before Abraham. That would only make him God. No other way that he, they could understand that. And they knew because of their faith that this was a claim to being God that none of them were ever, ever allowed to make or never, never would they make. I didn't exist before Abraham. You're crazy. But Jesus was making this statement clearly. And you can see from their response that they knew exactly what he was trying to say. Because they wanted to stone him for being a blasphemer. We talked about that when we studied the Ten Commandments. And so we've got Jesus using the same phrase. Now, Jesus did not use the phrase that meant the Lord or Yahweh. There are other places where he did that, but he was trying to point out that he has always existed. Now that just seems, Jesus doesn't leave us a choice. He doesn't leave us the choice of saying, well, he was just a great teacher. No, for someone to claim this, make this kind of claim, he would have to either, either be, it would either have to be true or Jesus was crazy. You really can't ignore that very real uh, understanding of what he was going to say. Now, let's go on a little bit further now. So we've talked about that, the significance of this statement, I am. Not only, again, did the statement refer to I exist, I have always existed as God used that, but I am always present. I am with you. I am going to be with you, Moses, and I am with the people. Now, let's go back and look at these statements. These are the, the nine statement phrases that we're going to study regarding what Jesus said. 
And we're going to start with tonight the I am the bread of life. Um, you will, as we go through the study, we'll, we'll handle one, more than one a week, but I want us to look at each one and try to understand what they mean. Now that I've given you this background, you can see how significant it was that Jesus said, I am the God who made all these things. And yet I'm also trying to help you understand in the same way that God wanted Moses to understand and communicate to the people, I am the Lord, your God. Jesus was trying to help us understand as well. So let's look at the first one. I am the bread of life. And we're going to start with John 6, 48 to 51. And if someone would please help me out and read that, I'd appreciate it. Start with uh, I am the bread of life and can read the rest of the verse. Anyone? I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Amen. Okay. Okay. Please also understand one of the things that Jesus did that was common to his teaching, um, and it comes somewhat from his position as being a rabbi, but Jesus would use natural things to explain spiritual things. He nearly always tried to do that because he knew that it would give people a way to have a spiritual understanding that would go beyond just listening to a lot of spiritual words being said as they would go into a worship like you and I would go. And you can go sit and listen to someone who's in a, I don't know, a church or, or, or whatever, who's saying a lot of things that just kind of go right over your head. Jesus didn't want people to experience that in, when they listen to his teaching. So he used these analogies to help. So let's look at the way he did that here. Look at the screen. Your fathers, and he's speaking to Jewish people, your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. Now, he didn't have to explain that to them. They knew that story. Let me refresh your memory. As the people came out of Egypt, as they left Egypt, by, and they were, there were several million of them, a few million. They're all, this, they're all marching, walking together, staying together. And they get out in the desert, and... God starts doing some things that are miraculous, but they complain. And they got to a point where they said, look, we're out here in the desert. We have nothing to eat. And instead of just being on their knees and petitioning God and saying, Father, God, you put us here. Certainly you can provide for us. Please provide. Instead, they complained. And what did they do? They complained about nothing to eat. And so it says in, if you look up the story, and I'm going to show it to you here, uh, in Exodus 16, I'll read it. Then the Lord said to Moses, now the people had complained, and God hears the complaints. He knows that they're, he knows they're hungry, but he says, the Lord said to Moses, behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. Now, here was the rule. Every morning when you wake up, you're going to go outside your tent and there's going to be this material on the ground that is like, it said like frost, but they said it was like angels, angel food or something. I mean, it was supposedly this very rich and plentiful food that they could use as bread. And it would collect on the ground and they went out each day and they were to gather up a certain amount for each person in the family. So the whole family would go out, we got, if we got a family of four or five or six or ten, I don't know how many, we'd gather as much as we needed, and God even told them the amount to gather for each person. Now, once the sun came up, it would, it would melt away. So you got to get up early and get out there. you got to gather only as much as you need. If you gathered more than what you need, the next morning it would rot. It only lasted 24 hours. It would literally rot and stink. And God said, you can only gather it for six days. I'm not going to rain manna down this beautiful, wonderful bread. It's not going to come on the seventh day. So on the, on the sixth day, 
you're supposed to gather enough for two days, and I will make sure it doesn't rot, God said, on the day of the Sabbath, because I don't want you working on the Sabbath. I want you to keep that day holy. So they would gather twice as much as they needed on the day before. I shouldn't say Saturday because that was their day of, of worship. The day before the Sabbath, they would gather enough for two days. It would not rot. And the next day after the Sabbath was over, it would start up again. This manna came in and they gathered it for 40 years. 40 years God provided. 40 years. Some of you aren't even 40 years old. That would have been all you had eaten for 40 years. You would have had to have been very creative in learning how to cook with manna. But God provided also, he provided meat. But I'm not going to go into that because Jesus was saying, let's go back to what Jesus was saying. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness, and you know what? They didn't live forever. They died. In fact, the Bible even tells us that the people who walked through the desert came out of Egypt, were not allowed to go into the promised land. And when they did cross over the Jordan into the promised land, the Bible says the manna stopped. A whole new generation got to go into the promised land. But he says, this is the bread that comes down from heaven, he's talking about the manna, so that one may eat of it and not die. Well, wait a minute, now he's talking about, well, that couldn't be the manna. He's not talking about the manna now, because the manna, they died. The manna was just a food for temporal physical need so he says i'm not talking to you i'm using manna as a metaphor for me but i've come down to heaven so that you won't die wow that's an interesting comparison i'm the living bread that's come down from heaven if anyone eats of this bread that's meaning himself he will live forever all right jesus is no longer talking about something that goes in your stomach He's not talking about something that's only going to last 24 hours and then it rots. He's not talking about something that God would stop providing when they got into the promised land. He's talking about something that will result in eternal life. The bread that I give for the life of the world, once again, this is the bread from heaven. This is the spiritual bread. I am like bread, Jesus said, but I'm giving myself, my body, my flesh. Now, they didn't know this at the time, but Jesus was talking about his death on the cross. Jesus was telling them that my death of giving up my life, giving up my body, is, he, is the purpose is to give you eternal life. So we do know that Jesus taught things that we should learn and apply and follow, but Jesus was specifically telling the people who are listening here that I am like the bread. I, am, I want you to understand how bread provided nourishment for you, but that bread was not the bread that's going to give you life eternal. I am the one who's going to give you my life as if it were bread to give you eternal life. So let me go back once again to what John said, because John understood this. John said, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Jesus was very clear about why he came, and this was just one of the I am's we talked about tonight, which illustrate why he came. He came to be bread like bread, but the bread that will give us eternal life. It's not, Holly, by the way, she, she feels sorry for me and she makes bread for me. And she makes, uh, makes bread in the oven that is to die for. I mean, if you could ever think of the most wonderful round loaf of bread that smells so good and it's, it's coming, it makes the whole house smell good. And she made a she made like a, an Italian loaf, and then she made one with rosemary, and then she made one with cinnamon and raisin for me to have at breakfast. I know your mouth must be watery, but that's the kind of feeling we get with bread. It's like it really is comfortable for us to enjoy bread. Jesus is saying, the bread that offers nourishment to you is only going to last as long as you're alive on earth. I'm here 
to be bread that will give you eternal life. And so Jesus was using that analogy, that metaphor, to help us understand. Okay, let's stop here. And I'd like to open up the, the time now. Anybody who wants to put on their mic and share anything that, or questions you have about what we discussed tonight, all of the things we discussed, the Gospel of John, the meaning of I am, and Jesus' first statement we're going to look at tonight, I am the bread of life. Any other thoughts? Please go ahead and share. Hey, brother, I was looking at the footnote in Exodus 3, the scripture where God says, I am who I am. And I was looking at the footnote and it, it says, um, yeah, those, those four um, letters, Y-H-W-A says, rendered Lord, which is derived from the verb haya, H-A-Y-A-H, yes. uh -huh. which, which means to be. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, it does. It, you're right. It does have the same connotation of being the words I am. It, it is. Did it's very much the that? same. Did you run into I'm sorry? that? Did you run into yes. that? Yes. Haya? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And okay. as we look at these phrases throughout our study where Jesus said, I am. He was speaking, of course, this is kind of a strange problem we have with our language. Jesus was speaking Aramaic. The Gospel of John was written and translated into Greek. So when we have a Greek text that has to be translated, they call that a tetragrammaton. A tetragrammaton meant a four-letter representation of another word. Tetra meaning four. So this tetragrammaton, Y-H-W-H, was the Greek equivalent of this Hebrew word, which was, I think, pronounced uh, hey-ye or something close to that. That's the best pronunciation I've seen. So, yes, all those things were wrapped up in that name. And the, and the Hebrew people began to create the tradition of referring to the name of God as many times. It's, it's, it's written, that word, those words, the Lord, which is translated into the Lord, uh, Yahweh, is written thousands of times throughout the scriptures. I think 3,000 times, 4,000 times. And it was each time translated into the Lord. So when you read that in the scriptures, especially when you read the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that was the translation that was given in English. Thanks. What other thoughts, other comments? I'm gonna eat more bread every day. Every day I'm gonna eat bread. <laughs> Amen to that. Hey, hey to that. Um, you, you, um, John's purpose here, you mentioned was, um, I think you said that, oh yeah, you used that scripture at the end of his uh, gospel. His purpose is to show that Christ or Jesus was, in fact, the Son of God. Um, and you can't be the Son of God unless you're God, 100%. You know, and the Jews understood that principle. They, if anybody understood the principle uh, of God, they knew exactly uh, when Jesus says, I am uh, um, the Son of God, or when he when he called God his his father, they were very very offended at that, and they say you're making yourself equal with God, and uh, it was very that's very interesting. All of that gospel is just amazing. Yeah, yeah, yes, I agree. Thank you. What are the, anyone else have others things to share um, other thoughts? I thought it was interesting when. Uh... When God says to the to the Jews in John eight that before Abraham I am, um, it kind of you know I always use Jesus as a as a, a shortcut because what he says is the truth and you don't have to back it up with anything else, and that kind of just uh, confirms the Christophanies of the Old Testament where Jesus, although doesn't appear in name, he appears in other forms. 
because he yeah. was there. Um, yeah. But another thing that struck me was uh, when they tried to stone him, he hid himself away. And I'm like, he, he doesn't need to do that, right? Like, he's God. So why, why did he even, why did he do that? Is it like a symbolism of him kind of just hiding, hiding the truth from the Jews because they won't accept it? Or I don't know. You have to, okay. have to get away from the stoning there. Right. But I mean, even though he was human, he was still God. So I'm like, uh, you know, wasn't he bulletproof? You know, he didn't have to hide. No, he was not bulletproof. <laughs> it just feels well, Jesus, strange. Jesus, Jesus subjected himself to his humanness. He went to the cross. He endured the brutal uh, handling and beating and, and treatment and then the ultimate death. And he didn't go there to the cross because he gave up, but instead he gave himself willingly to be subjected to that. Now, it seems to me based on Jesus' humanity, he ate, he got hungry, he was tempted in all points like we are, the Bible says, yet he didn't sin. Jesus experienced all of the limitations of being human. And so even when Satan tempted him to jump off of a high point uh, and let the angels catch him, Jesus refused. I think Jesus knew that he was going to end up living a human life and sacrificing himself. And so at that point, he knew this wasn't time. This wasn't my time to be assaulted and, and physically harmed. And so he could have, we know even in the garden, Jesus said, I could have called legions of angels to come and defend me if I wanted. So Jesus knew that he could, yes, he could stop the stones like we see somebody, you know, stopping the stones in midair. But it wasn't his time to demonstrate that kind of, of power. And we know because of his resurrection that he certainly had power over death. So I think that was, that was one of those <laughs> evidences of Jesus living out his humanity. I think it also this, occurs to me that it, he allowed himself to go through that. So we, as his, as his followers... We cannot expect to live a life of no of persecution. If, if he had to suffer to that, you know, how much more will we, right? Yeah. Thank you. Good point. The, let, let me read a scripture real quick. Philippians chapter 2, um, referring to Jesus, Paul says, who, although he existed in the form of God, did right. not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself taking the form of a bond servant and being made in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. It was a, it was on purpose. He came here for a purpose and he, God himself took on flesh, flesh and, flesh and blood. 